Welcome to this episode of NHM Live. We have a very packed show full of stories and full of wonderful and amazing specimens and secrets from the Natural History Museum. Now remember we are live so please send your comments and questions throughout the show and we'll try and get through as many as possible in the show. But first let's talk a little bit about beetles and not the singing kind. Hello and welcome to the Natural History Museum's Beetle Collection. And here behind you, you have one of the largest, one of the oldest, one of the most important collections of its kind anywhere in the world. We have about 25,000 drawers of specimens, about 8 to 10 million individual beetles. And let me show you some of the highlights. This is the largest species of beetle in the world. It's called Titanus giganteus, and it lives in the rainforests of northern Brazil and the Guianas. They can get 17 centimeters long, and they fly towards electric light, which might be quite alarming. In the bottom of the drawer here is the smallest beetle in the world, a feather-wing beetle, which is 0.3 of a millimeter long. And those are found worldwide, so you can probably find them in your garden if you look carefully enough. This is a drawer of beetles collected by Charles Darwin himself on the voyages of the Beagle in the 1830s. And uh, he was a young man when he had the opportunity to attend this um, five-year circumnavigation of the world. And during the voyage, he collected some 8,000 beetle specimens. And most of these were named by Natural History Museum scientists, several of them named Darwin I in his honor, and are preserved here at the museum. So these are the actual specimens handled, collected, and labeled by the young Darwin on his expedition. Now the beetles are the largest and the most diverse group of organisms on the planet. Scientists have so far named more than 400,000 different species. And to give you a snapshot of the diversity, this is a collection made by one of our scientific associates in a mountain range in Tanzania in a period of about four or five days. So that just gives you an idea of the vast diversity of this group of insects. And he is with us in the studio today. Hi, Max. How are you Hi, doing? Hi, Christina. Thank you. Brilliant. Thank you so much for joining us today in the show. Uh, Max, you look after one of the biggest collections in the museum. It's amazing. Almost one out of eight specimens in the museum is abyssal. Is this radio ratio similar in the natural world? Actually, the ratio in the natural world is probably even greater because about one in eight of the specimens at the museum is a beetle. But with 400,000 species, there's only about one and a half million named organisms on the planet. So we might be looking at 20, 25% of described known biodiversity as beetles. That's amazing. My, man, my mind gets blown every time I think about beetles and the diversity. How are they so diverse? 
Well, I think part of the reason is that they were in the right place at the right time in their evolutionary history. The ancestors of the beetles were probably associated with the ancestors of the flowering plants. Mm -hmm. And as the flowering plants spread over the world, the beetles spread with them. And also, each plant species might be host to 5, 10, 15, 20 different kinds of beetle. There might be one eating the flowers, one eating the seeds, one eating the leaves, one eating the stems. <laughs> And so an oak tree in the British countryside might support one or two hundred species of beetle. Oh my gosh. Um, and you've studied these beetles really, really well. What's the quirkiest adaptation or specialization that you found? Well, with, as I say, 400,000 types, <laughs> you get an extraordinary variety of forms because uh, beetles have dominated many uh, uh, terrestrial ecosystems all over the world. Mm -hmm. And uh, some of the most peculiar ones, and this is a, a longhorn beetle from Brazil, and it has the last segment of the antenna developed into a stinger, like a scorpion stinger. Wow. So it's got this barb and this little venom sac. And if you were a monkey and you wanted to pick that beetle up, it can sting you with its antennae. And this group of beetles, the longhorns, there's about 25,000 species, and there's only one or two that can do this. And mm -hmm. so predator is really not going to expect <laughs> that. <laughs> That's amazing because beetles, when I was little, was the insect that uh, I never was uh, scared of because I thought, oh, they can't do anything to you. But now well, unless you go to uh, one particular small Fair area enough. of forest, <laughs> you're probably right. And you showed us those huge um, specimens, the huge beetles uh, from South America. Um, and the smallest one, which mm -hmm. actually you can find in the UK as well. Um, what is the biggest beetle that you can find in the UK though? Well, the biggest beetle that we have in this country is the, uh, the stag beetle. And in fact, there are three species of stag beetle in Britain. Mm -hmm. And this is the greater stag beetle. And this is a male of the greater stag beetle. It's quite a rare species, but they can be found relatively abundantly around southwest mm -hmm. London and the southern part of England. And the males are much larger. And they're also much more conspicuous because mm. they fly around in search of a female on warm summer evenings in June and July. You'll see these beetles drifting around in the evening, oh, right. uh, the big males. They use the antlers for fighting in the same way as a stag, which is why they're <laughs> stag beetles. That's amazing. So our viewers could um, actually keep an eye out and maybe see them this summer. Oh, yes. You'll find them in London. Now, Max, you also showed us some of Darwin specimens that he collected when, when he was traveling around the world on the Beagle. How do you feel when you are handling lots of specimens, when you're looking after them? Well, working in a collection like this, you're in touch with history every day. And specimens collected by Darwin almost 200 years ago are as fresh and as useful scientifically as they were when they were collected. And it's nice to see the handwriting and the historical provenance of that specimen that Often he's written about in his books or in his journals, mm -hmm. and you've got the specimen there in front of oh. you, <laughs> preserved. <laughs> That's and, uh, amazing. The continuity of science being handed on from generation to generation is very exciting. Absolutely. Now, we have loads of wonderful uh, specimens here at the museum. Some of them make amazing mystery specimens. So let's have a look at this month's one. <laughs> Now it's your turn to try and guess this mystery specimen. Send us your suggestions via Facebook or Periscope, whichever way you are watching. Now, Max, I've got another question for you. In the whole diversity of the beetle collection, have you got any parasites? There are only a few beetles that are parasites. There are some beetles, um, there's a, a, a ground beetle larva that you get in Japan and China that will go out and find frogs and toads and it will grab onto them. <laughs> and it's brightly coloured lava, and it just hangs there like a necktie, sucking <laughs> the juices out of, um, out of the, the, the host. But it's not really a parasite in the strictest sense of the word. Mm -hmm. There are also um, beetles that live in the fur of beavers and other uh, aquatic mammals, mm -hmm. and those ones live very much like lice or fleas and have an almost parasitic lifestyle. 
Brilliant. I think we can find parasites in loads of uh, different groups of animals and specimens. Uh, parasites are something that we have loads of here in the museum as well. So let's check out some of them in our collection. So Ian, what is it that makes the death's head hawk moth such an interesting parasite? Well, most moths drink nectar from flowers, but these guys steal honey from honeybees. They look a bit like honeybees, but of course they're a lot bigger. But the way that they get through the uh, front door of the hive is that they smell like honeybees. And then once in, they make a squeaking noise. And this, we think, mimics the queen bee. And she makes that noise when she wants to calm the workers down. So we think that the moths are trying to calm the workers down so that they don't get in the way when they're stealing the honey. So it's a really amazing multi-level camouflage to get them through that door. Yes, very much so. Let's go see if we can discover some more parasites in our museum collections. Natalia, what are we looking at here? So we have here some examples of helminths of cetaceans. For instance, over here, so some digenians or flukes, in this case that were found in the, in the liver of a striped dolphin, and in this case in the liver of a minke whale. And what about the ones we have over here? So over here we have nematodes that were found in the earth sinuses of a harbor porpoise, mm -hmm. and in this case a cantocephalans in the intestine of a killer whale. So it really seems like they're found in lots of different places across the cetacean's body. Do they cause them any distress when they're living inside of them? Well, they're parasites, so they do cause harm to the host, although the intent on the, the impact of that uh, harm largely depends on the intensity of the infection, so how many uh, parasites or specimens are in, the, in a single host, or the location. So for instance, in, uh, parasites in the earth sinuses could be problematic, or the ones in the liver can cause a severe inflammatory reaction in, in host tissue. Well, it's really interesting stuff, thank you so much. My pleasure. Erica, what makes a parasitoid different from a parasite? A parasitoid ultimately results in the death of the host. Take this little example, well, obviously this is one of the smaller ones you it's can tiny. get. It is <laughs> tiny. And these we affectionately call ant decapitating flies. Sounds very vicious. Yeah, and it kind of gives you a hint to what they do. So once the larvae, the female, the mother, lays it in the, in the ant, it crawls up through the thorax of the <laughs> ant into the brain. Okay. It spends about two weeks munching away at the brain. The ant is carrying along, doing its stuff, walking around. And then depending on the species, it will release an enzyme that causes the head to fall off. So it's decapitated it. <laughs> but this is now, given this little larvae, this absolutely protected environment in which to pupate in before it emerges an adult. This is one of the ones that specifically attacks fire ants. So we have this species that has made its way from South America to North America. It's highly evasive, invasive, highly aggressive, but this one specifically attacks it. So it's very beneficial. Amazing, incredible stuff. So we see that parasites, they might seem like a bit of a nasty bunch, but they actually are incredibly important in our ecosystem, making sure that nothing gets too dominant at the top of the food chain. Eddie has introduced you to some of the parasites that we have here in our collection at the Natural History Museum, but we have many more. And we also have scientists study them, and we have one of them with us today. Hello, Tom. Hi. How are you doing? I'm very good, thank, thank you. Thank you as well for joining us tonight. Pleasure. Um, now, you study parasites. Correct. But a different one than the one we've seen over here. Which parasite do you study, Tom? Um, so I actually work on a, a flatworm parasite um, called schistosomiasis. That's the disease, but the actual parasite is called schistosomes. Mm -hmm. um, there we've been talking mainly about animals or well, parasites that infect animals but actually like there's also a lot of um, research going on in the museum of parasites that infect humans mm -hmm. and so schistosomes are one of them uh, it's a big problem in mainly in Africa and also in South America and also parts of Asia mm -hmm. um, and my research mainly focuses on on these parasites and the transmission that happens in Africa and, and elsewhere. Mm -hmm. So the host of the schistosomes is humans? Yeah, correct, yeah. Uh, schistosomes also, there's d several different species of schistosomes, so some actually do infect animals, so you get uh, bovine parasites, for example, that infect cows and mm -hmm. sheep and goats, uh, but then also ones that infect humans. Um, so I'm kind of like, my research actually focuses on a, a bit of both, but predominantly on the human side of it. Brilliant. Um, and so this is a, a disease that affects humans then. Is it a medicine to treat it, Tom? Yeah, there is. So it's a good question, really, because 
basically there's only one drug that we're widely using at the moment to okay. treat schistomyosis and it's called praziquantel mm -hmm. and that's just because it's very difficult to actually kill parasites so this particular drug praziquantel we don't even really know how it works yet we just know that it does actually effectively relieve uh, mm -hmm. the intensity of infection for people taking it um, potentially by paralyzing the worm and then the body actually flushing out the parasite itself okay. Um, but there is, there's a lot of groups around the world, not necessarily here at the museum, but they're actually looking for new drug targets and new ways to actually kill, kill this parasite within the human body. Mm -hmm. Are there any other ways that it's not just taking the medicine? Yeah, the so diet? the actual schistomes itself, like the parasite, the, the life cycle it has, which we've not mentioned yet, is it, it goes from the human and then the parasite is released into the fresh water from mm -hmm. either urinating or defecating in fresh water. Mm -hmm. The parasite can then hatch from its egg that then swims onto <coughs> a, a snail. And in that side, that snail, the parasite replicates again, then the infective form comes out and infects the human. So if you think about that parasite and how it works, then we can see a few targets there to have interventions. One being that you can stop humans from uh, defecating or urinating in water by providing mm -hmm. better sanitation, um, better access to toilets, and also places to wash and wash clothes, wash themselves, and bikes and cars, etc. Yeah. And also we can think about the snail and look at targeting snails. If we deplete that population of snails, then we're not getting a transmission from one person to another. Right. Um, and I bet this is not the only parasite that can affect humans. Are there any other popular one or examples of There's parasites? There's really a lot of parasites that infect humans, and we could be here all day speaking about them. Um, <laughs> I've picked out one from the collection here, which is a parasite called Diphlebophrium. Um, it's a tapeworm that you can get from eating raw fish. Okay. Uh, so it's becoming, I picked that one up particularly because it's becoming more popular. People are eating more sushi and ceviche nowadays. And these kind of foodborne parasites are becoming more prevalent. And that will quite happily live inside the gut of a, a human. And this is actually from a human itself, which is quite cool. Oh, um, wow. So that was inside of a human. Yeah, it was so one, well. at one point. <laughs> yeah, in 1983 to be exact. Okay. <laughs> uh, but yeah, I mean, there's also many other different parasites, some that have direct life cycles whereby people are getting infected by the parasite penetrating through the skin mm -hmm. or from consuming the eggs in food or by unwashed hands or dirt that are present on the hands or whatever. Mm -hmm. um, and there's, ri there's really a lot of different parasitic life cycles and a lot that do have a massive impact on humans around the world. Mm -hmm. Can I ask you a, b a bit of a naughty question? Have you ever had a parasite yourself, Tom? Yeah, very naughty. <laughs> Uh, yeah, no, actually, yeah, I did have, a, I've had a parasite called Strongyloides, uh, which is, which I've only just recently found out I've fully been cleared of, um, but yeah, I was quite, probably from doing this, actually, <laughs> um, yeah, uh, and it's a parasite that actually penetrates directly through the skin and then can live in the gut. Um, and I knew I had one for a long time, <laughs> but it was just getting the correct diagnosis. You were like, I've got a parasite, I yeah, know this. <laughs> yeah, and I said to the doctor, who I also know, was like, I'm sure I've got one. He was pretty sure I had one too, and we eventually got rid of it, hopefully. I literally just got the email today saying that my blood levels and counts are all normal, well. and uh, luckily looking all good. So, yeah. <laughs> well, congratulations yeah. about that. Not about having the parasite, yeah, yeah. about but getting you got to bring your work home with you, you know. <laughs> yeah. Maybe you can donate it to the museum if yeah. you get it out. <laughs> now, we had some questions um, coming from our audience, really exciting ones. Uh, we have James on Facebook. This question is for you, Max. What's your favorite beetle? Oh, that's a difficult <laughs> question. Um, it's probably something small and brown and newly discovered that's never been seen before. <laughs> <laughs> that's always the, the exciting thing. Is um, uh, We found something in Peru recently under some, some rocks by a fast-flowing torrent up in the Andes, and it really shouldn't have been there. There was no relatives known from that area. Oh, wow. So you know immediately in the field that you're staring at something that's never been seen by a, a scientist before. And that's very exciting when that happens. Yes, yeah, so it's not about the favourite one, it's about the one that it's more not excites about how you, it isn't it? Is. It's yeah. really about how, how new it is. And That's brilliant. We also have another question uh, from Rosie on Facebook. I think it could be from either one of you. Um, she's asking, what colour is the blot of the specimens that you study? <sighs> if it's different to us. What colour is your... What colour is the what, sorry? The blot. The blot? Yeah. I don't know what you're the referring blood. to. Yeah. Oh, the blood. The blood. Oh, the yeah, blood. sorry. <laughs> ah, sorry. Um, well, parasites actually, a lot of them do consume blood from the human, so actually the blood will be pretty much red. the same colour as yeah. the human, so red, purple. Mm. And again, with a lot of insects like mosquitoes, they'll find that they're carrying your blood around with them, and that's why <laughs> they're red when you squish them. Yeah. But um, the an insect equivalent of blood is called hemocele, and it's kind of clearish, mm. maybe a little bit bluish. Yeah. Oh, okay. That's cool. I think that's always interesting, yeah, for, for us to know things that are not exactly like humans. Um, and also from Andrew on Facebook, again for you, Max, uh, are beetles important pollinators? 
Oh yes, very much so. I mean, everybody talks, everybody knows about bees and everybody knows about flies and mm -hmm. butterflies and moths. But in many uh, plants, uh, beetles are extremely important pollinators and some palm trees and things, beetles can be the most important pollinators. Brilliant, thank you guys. Those were amazing questions. But now we're gonna go on to news with Josh. <laughs> Hello! This month saw museum scientists set out on a six-week expedition across the South Atlantic with the Centre for Environmental Fisheries and Aquaculture Science. So far they've travelled over 4,000 kilometres from the Falkland Islands to Tristan da Cunha, one of the most remote inhabited islands in the world. Along their voyage they've been sampling the deep sea, revealing a whole host of unusual and beautiful fish, including the wonderful black sea devil and the fearsome dragonfish. Keep an eye out over the next few weeks to see what other incredible finds they make whilst at that sea. Now, from the waters of the South Atlantic to the badlands of Wyoming, USA, as museum paleontologists have just announced that they'll be joining the Children's Museum of Indianapolis on a brand new dinosaur dig, as Dr. Susanna Maidman explains. In collaboration with the Children's Museum of Indianapolis and Naturalis in Leiden, we are going out to Wyoming um, to dig up dinosaurs and we're going to a part of Wyoming called the Bighorn Basin, where there are rocks that are about 150 million years old. And these rocks are called the Morrison Formation. And they were deposited by us, rivers and floodplains. Um, and these rivers and floodplains were home to all of your favorite dinosaurs, Stegosaurus, Brachiosaurus, Allosaurus, all of the dinosaurs you knew when you were seven. And we are going out there to hope to find some exciting new dinosaurs. Um, this part of the Morrison Formation is not as well explored as other parts of the formation further south. So what we're hoping to find when we go out there is some old friends, but also some new species and new genera, and be the first people to uncover and describe these animals ever. We'll keep you up to date over the coming months with all the latest from Mission Jurassic. And finally, a new species of extinct pig-footed bandicoot has been described from Australia. These unusual marsupials once roamed across much of the outback and are the only known marsupial to have evolved hoof-like feet. Museum scientists helped review all known specimens of these animals, which are thought to have gone extinct in the 1950s as changes in land use altered their habitat. The researchers found that rather than just a single species, Australia was actually home to two distinct species of pig-footed bandicoot, differentiated by their coat colour and feet proportions. Now, back to the studio with Christina. <laughs> So many projects happening and um, happening in the future as well, so many field trips. Now, Max and Tom, I bet you have your own share of field trips. Uh, Max, for example, what's your favourite place that you've been on a field trip? Well, I think the most exciting field trip, uh, I, I've, I've been in Asia and in tropical South America, but I think recently I was in the Alto Madre de Dios in Peru, mm -hmm. and uh, oh, that's where that picture was taken. <laughs> and uh, that's on a fallen tree in the middle of the rainforest. And if you can find a fallen tree, you can really clean up uh, for insects <laughs> because the sunlight gets through the canopy to the forest floor and all the young trees start to come up. And so you get enormous diversity of insects in those small areas. And uh, that was incredibly exciting. We had some great collaborators from the, um, the museum in Lima, and uh, we spent three or four weeks out there. That's amazing. So um, and Tom, you were recently in Tanzania yeah. uh, on a field trip. Have yeah. you got any plans to come in back there soon? Yeah, yeah. Well, we try and get back there quite regularly to do regular collections, such as this mm. picture here where we're collecting snails. Um, actually, it's kind of coming to the end of, like, I've just had a very busy period for the last few years of travelling back and forth very regularly. Mm -hmm. And now I'm in a stage where I'm actually trying to keep my results all together and writing up. So there was a plan of maybe going in a few weeks to uh, Zanzibar, but it kind of depends on how... Uh, my experiments are going there. I actually have mm. some snails living there now that I'm doing a study on, uh, but a lot there's been a bit of a decline in the population, so if there's no population left, then uh. there's no reason for me to go back, unfortunately. But we'll see what happens. There you go. Yeah. And if you go on any trip, please come back and report with us. We'll be, I'll be really looking forward to hear about them. <laughs> Behind me is Black Ben, near Lyme Regis, where Mary Anning did a lot of her hunting. 
Mary was really the first person who looked inside coprolites and saw the remains of fish with scales and bone. And this prompted William Buckland, who was a well-known geologist, to confirm that they were coprolites, which is fossilised faeces. The study of coprolites tells you key information about an animal's diet and predation habits. Mary Anning's dedication and observation showed that there's great scientific value in looking at even trivial things, even poo. So these remind us that poo is also really important in science. And in fact, we're going to turn to our guest because I think, Tom, you've been looking into poo in your research as well, haven't yeah, you? lots of poo, yeah. <laughs> Why were you looking into poo? Um, well, there's many parasites, including schistosomes, actually, uh, especially a, sp a species called Schistoma mansoni <laughs> um, that is prevalent in Tanzania and also other parts of Africa. Uh, that Actually, uh, the parasite eggs are released in the, the poo. Um, so yeah, I've been looking a lot at poo recently to actually <laughs> find parasites. And this is actually a picture of um, some cow poo that I've just been looking at maybe just over a month ago now in, in Pem on Pember Island in Zanzibar. Mm -hmm. And that was because I discovered a species of parasite that hadn't been occurring on the islands there before in snails. And then I wanted to find proof that it was actually in the animal and therefore it meant sifting through <laughs> a lot of poo to actually find the parasite in there, which I eventually did, which was great. But that's unpublished, so... <laughs> so we'll keep that quiet, all of us on Facebook. Um, Max, what about beetles? Is beetle poo important? Well, dung beetles are very important. They're the most important recyclers of poo. Yeah. And if we didn't have dung beetles, the whole place could be covered in poo. <laughs> and they discovered that when people first brought sheep and cows to Australia, they didn't bring any dung beetles. And they had a problem uh. with the poo just lying on the pasture and crusting over and breeding flies and so on. Oh. So eventually the Australian government had to bring dung beetles <laughs> over in order to solve the problem that they caused by bringing the cows and the sheep in the first place. Wow. So we handle a lot of poo when we're collecting dung beetles. Often we can't get enough, in fact. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, definitely poo is really important. Now we have a few more questions for our audience, uh, really, really cool ones. Um, Alison on Facebook is asking whether parasites can be positive at all. Can they be positive? Mm. Uh, there's some ways that you could say they were positive. So there's an interesting thing which we were actually briefly discussing before this when uh, parasites can actually adapt to the immune system to how uh, we react to things like allergies and stuff. So there's a hypothesis called the hygiene hypothesis that actually means that your immune system is shifted depending on if you're infected with worms or not. And that's been a leading cause of maybe saying that that's why the in areas where worms are endemic and people are infected with parasites, there's less chance of people actually having allergic reactions. So common things we have here like hay fever, food allergies, aller allergies to cats and dogs, they're, mm. they're less prevalent in endemic areas and it's maybe due to this shift in the immune system yeah. caused by parasite, parasitic that's worms. That's amazing. So there's more to study in there and parasites as well oh regarding yeah. that topic. Yeah, yeah. Brilliant. Guys, we also had some guesses on our mystery specimen. Uh, we had uh, somebody who suggested uh, it might be a chocolate cake. We don't know. Beef jerky. Okay, a prune as well. We'll see. Um, I think our favourite guest so far is, somebody said, it's a gruffalo, which I think is a children's uh, book monster. <laughs> Great. And somebody might be getting really really close somebody said uh, it might be a flying squirrel um have you got any ideas maybe keep them to yourselves if you do but mm. well it's guesses? definitely not a parasite i'm not, not sure parasite? about that not one of the four hundred thousand species <laughs> <laughs> um th i think there are a few closer um guesses um and i think it's about time to reveal our mystery specimen so let's see <laughs> Okay, so the flying squirrel, you can tell, was so, so close. Our mystery specimen was a hammet-headed bat. You saw it at the end of the video. You can see it in a picture. Now, it's a weird-looking specimen. We had James and Andrew on Facebook. Um, 
guessing, getting a little bit closer as well to it, they might have suggested that it was a bat. And this specimen is um, actually amazing. When they um, are live, alive, they live in uh, the West Equatorial Zone of Africa, and they have this weird shaped head. It looks a bit like a horse or, a, or an elk, and they use this shape to actually make a honking noise. So yeah, that's cool. And apparently these um, bats also have a wide range of parasites in them, Tom. So it might be something to look into there. Uh, yeah. um, now, we have a, uh, time for a few more questions over here. Um, oh, this is actually a really good question. Andrew is asking us, can parasitoids get parasites? Or maybe can parasites get parasites? Can parasites get parasites? Um, yeah, probably. Um, <laughs> I'm trying to think of an example off the top of my head. I can't think of one right now, but likely parasitoids. Um, yeah, I believe so. I mean, I think if you look at stuff like parasitoid wasps, so they have a fascinating life cycle where they usually infect like a caterpillar that then the larva produce inside, then the larva hatch out of the caterpillar. Mm -hmm. The caterpillar is then like, the mind is changed by the process of having larvae and it's probably the, the virus that it's infected with from the larva itself. And it then looks after the larva brood of the parasitoid wasps. And if it didn't do that, it'd probably be likely that those larvae would then get more parasites. And I think mm -hmm. that's one of the, the leading causes why the caterpillar then looks after the, the brood after it's been, mm -hmm. after it's hatched. But apart from that, can't think of any. There's so many though, Tom. So yeah. I mean, you can't know them all. No, no. <laughs> what about beetles, Matt? Can they have parasites? Oh, a lot of beetles have got parasites and uh, um, some of these uh, Gordian worms that can develop inside uh, a beetle and the beetle falls into water and then this worm comes out and you just can't believe that all this worm fitted in that beetle because it's so enormous. Yeah. Mm -hmm. so. That's uh, actually an amazing one as well. Max didn't mention but it actually changes the mind of the beetle to actually drive it to go to water, I believe. Is that right? <laughs> that's right, yeah. that's right. So yes. it's actually forcing it to commit suicide, really. There's a, a scientific collaboration right here. Yeah, yeah, there. There that's, that's lovely. <laughs> that's right. the, worm, the worm wants to be in the water. Yeah. The beetle doesn't want the to be in the water. The beetle doesn't want to be in there, no. The water <laughs> Brilliant. Thank you so much, guys. And thank you, everyone, for watching. But we've run out of time. Don't worry. We've got another show coming next month. So um, come and watch that there. But from now on, goodbye. See you next time. Thank <laughs> you.